Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast and the Good Question Podcast. A really cool guest today. Uh, her name is Helene Wecker. She's the author of The Gollum and the Genie, which was a really fantastic book that I read uh, on my own years ago and then again with my son recently. And her new book is called The Hidden Palace, which is like the sequel to uh, The Gollum and the Genie. And I just wanted to speak to her. I thought it would be so cool to speak to the author of, uh, you know, two books that I love. So, Helene, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, because of the uh, the subject matter of the books and your name, I don't know, I just assume you're some mysterious foreign woman that lived in like, I don't know, Syria or Azerbaijan or something. <laughs> you know, not, not that it's a disappointment, but it just seems like because of the books, topics and everything that you'd be this, again, this very unusual, like, you know, European or Eastern European lady that was shrouded in mystery. But uh, what, what's your background? And then I want to ask you, you know, how you came to write these books. Oh, well, I, I feel so bad that I... <laughs> I'm, I'm just a it's suburban okay. Jewish mom. Um, so my background is I grew up outside Chicago in a little town called Libertyville. Grew up Jewish. I, I in the 80s and 90s, you know, went to public high school, got bat mitzvahed, all of that. Went to uh, Carleton College in Minnesota and got my, my bachelor's in English and women's studies. And so, you know, was doing very much the, you know, the, the liberal arts education, wanted to, wanted to be a writer sort of my whole life. I'd always written, I'd always, you know, a lot of it was like bad fanfic, you know, but you got to start somewhere. Um, and, but at the same time, by the time I got to college, it was like sort of ingrained in me that I needed to have a jobby job, like a job that was going to pay bills, a nine to five with, you know, a briefcase and, and a 401k. And so at graduate, when I graduated, I went into marketing and communication and did that for about seven years. And along the way, as I was, you know, sort of feeling my soul crumble a little bit more every day, because I just, you know, it's, it's, it's a great was field, the, but the it was the treasury of the work? It was, you know, in the end, really what it was about was that I was writing press releases about other people's awesome life works. And I wasn't put doing my own, you know, work that was going to be what I put out of myself into the world. And yeah, some of it was, you know, corporate drudgery. I mean, one of the first things I, one of the first places I worked was a, um, a software company that has been since subsumed like three times over and is now, you know, some infinitesimal, oh God, I said that horribly, part of Oracle. But now, you know, and I still have friends from that time and whatever, but, but then I moved to Seattle and uh, worked for a public television station. And I was still just hating my actual, you know, day-to-day -day job. And that was when it was like, okay, here is a cause that I believe in. Here is something that, you know, I really, you know, public television, like what a great, you know, sort of 
place to work. It, it was very friendly. It was, you know, you felt like you were doing something good for society, but it was still just wasn't what it, it it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. So at that point was when I made the decision to get back into writing. And I was very fortuitously laid off from the public television station at around mm. that time and started writing these short stories that were like the first fiction that I had written in probably, oh gosh, you know, like 10 years or so. And it was immediately felt like, you know, this is stuff that I'm writing for like night classes, you know, for, for like continuing education, intro to creative writing. And immediately felt like this is more rewarding and means more to me than any of the stuff that I've worked on in my actual career in like the last seven years. So mm. at that point was, I was like, okay, I need to really, you know, do this for a living or at least try, you know, I, I wasn't, mm. I wasn't enough of a, an idiot to know that, you know, you can just start writing and it becomes your living. I, 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 I knew what right. the odds were. But I decided what I wanted to do was go and get my master's. And I acquired back at Carleton um, a boyfriend um, named Kareem. And he had, you know, I'd moved with him out to uh, Seattle for his career. And then along this, you know, we've become more and more serious. So I applied to a bunch of grad schools, got into Columbia, which was just sort of insane to me, and proposed to him in the same mm -hmm. weekend. And then we were off and I moved to New York and that was the beginning of like my creative writing sort of like, okay, I'm giving this my all now. I'm going into a decent amount of debt and I'm giving this my all and I'm going to write. And what happened was I, you get to a program like Columbia and they say, okay, you're going to, by the time you get out of here, you're going to need to have a body of work that's going to be your thesis. This is what you're going to, the, on, the, on the strength of which you will graduate or not. And that it can be a collection of short stories, it can be part of a novel, but you know, you need to start thinking about it basically from the day that you get there because this is like the corpus that you're going to build as you are a, you know, as, as you are a student. and right. I decided what I was going to do was I was going to write this series of connected short stories. Very realist, very, you know, Raymond Carver-esque, nothing that could happen in them that wouldn't happen in real life. And they were going to be about my family history and my husband's family's history. And so, you know, I, me growing up as Jewish girl in the Chicago suburbs, the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. The fact that like it took me a number of years to realize that not every grandparent had an accent. I thought other people's grandparents were weird because they didn't have accents. I thought, you know, all families came from somewhere else. I thought like, you know, it, it was normal to me that there was this like huge shrouded thing in the family's history that no one really talked about, but everyone knew about. In, in my case, you know, the Holocaust. And then in Kareem's family's history, um, being the child of an immigrant and having, you know, growing up during the, you know, Iraq War era as an Arab American kid going to high school and, you know, getting called all sorts of names and having sort of the worst horrors of the Syrian regime in his family's history, as well as, and, and then, you know, coming together, us meeting at college, and then having these resonances sort of crop up over and over again, specifically around issues of immigration and being the child of an immigrant family and how it just makes you feel like you're just a little weird. You're always going to be yeah. just a little weird. And so I was telling these tales through like the family, through through the generations. And there was this Jewish girl, an Arab American boy who were sort of threading through and meeting up every once in a while. And the problem mm -hmm. I started running into was that the stories just weren't good enough. They were not what I wanted them to be. Part of this was because I wasn't I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my chops yet. I, I just wasn't a good enough writer yet. But part of it also was that I was telling stories that I knew by heart. 
you know, I was fictionalizing them a little bit for, you know, just, just to sort of not, not, just so that it wasn't like straight up family memoir, so that it was, you know, actual fiction, but also so that they, you know, sort of hung together a little better, that they formed their own little world. But I knew everything, and so I wasn't discovering anything as I wrote it. And it was like, it was like it's, I was telling a story I told a million times before, and that was the energy that it had on the page. Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. So how did, how did you, um, so I understand you grew up Jewish, so that uh -huh. part of the culture makes sense. The Syrian part, is that also part of your heritage? Or how did you uh, understand that culture and incorporate it? I had, I have no, you know, my family is full on Ashkenazi Jewish. And, you know, my, my dad's parents were from Poland. My mom's parents were from Germany. And there's no, absolutely, there's absolutely no Middle Eastern heritage in my family in that sense. Kareem's family, his, his dad is, grew up a uh, Sunni Muslim in Syria in a town called Hama. And his mom is actually a Polish Catholic in Chicago, but they met in France in the set, the late 60s, and that was where uh, Kareem's older sister and he were born, and then eventually they came to the U.S. in, in like the early 70s. And I had really known no Arab Americans growing up that I can think of, and, you know, growing up it was, you know, Syria was what you heard in the news, and they were fighting Israel. So that, I mean, that was the extent of my you know, Eastern awareness, you know, you know, as, as a Jewish American girl growing up, you know, identifying with the Jews in the news and, and you know, and, and, and sort of getting that, you know, sort of surface level awareness of Middle Eastern politics and then meeting someone who was actually, con you know, connected to, you know, an Arab American family, you know, and, and had roots in Syria. That was altogether new to me. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, it took a, it was, it was a very deep learning process for both of us and a lot of, you know, processing along the way. And, you know, it still is in the way that any relationship like that is, you know, you're still, you know, run up against things sometimes and, or you, you know, you just hit spots in your knowledge where it's like, oh, I don't know anything about this. I had better learn. So what happened from there was that these stories being sort of bad. I'm sitting and talking to a friend of mine who was in the workshop, and I was just complaining about it. You know, what am I going to do here? These, you know, these, these aren't very good, and I want to be a better writer than this. And she said something to me that basically changed the course of my life, which was, Helene, I don't understand why you're writing in this style, in these very realist MFA short stories, when I know you and I know what a nerd you are and what a sci-fi and fantasy fiend you are and that's all that you read when, you know, you're not reading something for class. That's all you talk about in class when, you know, talk of the fantastical comes up and, and you, that's what you advocate for. So why aren't you writing like that? And okay. I was like... I don't, you know, and to this day, I'm not entirely sure why. I mean, it just made so much sense, and it just needed, it was like I just needed someone to just sort of slap me upside the head and say, what are you, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you writing in something that isn't your style? And she said, so the next thing I see from you in workshop, it can be about your families, but I want it to be fantastical. And I was like, okay. And I, I, I just I just sort of took it as marching orders because I felt like I needed someone to tell me what to do at that point. And I went back to my apartment and I said, okay, so what if instead of the Jewish girl and the Arab American boy who are in these stories, what if we like sort of Neil Gaiman this up? And what if we turn this in, you know, make them into the most emblematic folkloric creature from each culture? What if we made them a girl mm -hmm. golem? 
and a boy, Jeannie. And that was, it was like within the next, I don't know, few hours, I had written the first dozen pages of what would go on to turn into the Golem and the Genie. And, you know, it oh, was like cool. every decision that I made, like that day, just cascaded into this book, this giant book, you know, I did, that I did not know, realize that I was writing. I thought it was just another short story. And I was like, okay, I'll just set it at like the turn of the 20th century because it has this sort of folkloric feel to it. And I'll put it in, I'll set it in New York because, you know, where are two creatures like that going to bump into each other? Well, if you were taking this as like an immigration story, then, you know, and coming to America, it's got to be New York because this is, you know, this feels sort of Ellis Island to me and you know and so on and I knew absolutely nothing at that point about life at the turn of the 20th century I knew you know I was like okay well we'll set it you know we'll, we'll do the Jewish Lower East Side I didn't even know that a little Syria existed I had to find I had to research that and, and and sort of find out for myself that there was this actual neighborhood called little Syria sort of at the the southern tip of Manhattan and yeah that, that, that's what I was going to ask you is that the time period of the book is right about what 1900 mm -hmm. and how did you how did you know what was going on during that time period a and lot of thank you to research right? oh my goodness it was just a lot of research I mean and luckily at that point I was still at, I was at Columbia so I had access to their library and I just it was like me and the Xerox machine and like going through stacks in the library and finding you know the records of neighborhood meetings from you know, 1898 or whatever, where, you know, this new neighborhood is forming called Little Syria, and, and, and it's full of, you know, people from, well, what is now Lebanon, you know, back then it was, it was a you know, part of greater Syria, and there were all Lebanese Christians, so there were, you know, very few Muslims that come over at that time, so that was something I hadn't expected, I was like, okay, well, if I want to be true to the history, which I did, need to learn about Lebanese Christians, which I knew even less about than, than you know, than Syrian Muslims at that point. So it was just a giant education, which, you know, and just like the logistics of how did someone get an apartment back then? How did you, um, you know, know what time it was if no one, if, you know, the, the rich people had pocket watches, but what about everyone else? You know, what, how did you, what sort of restaurants were available? What was, you know, just how were, how was life lived in that time in for, you know, from like the street level, what would be, what would really trip up an immigrant? And more than that, what would trip up someone who isn't just like new to the city, but new to humanity? Because I had that these two sort of arrived, you know, by accident, both of them were not expecting to you know, arrive in the in the middle of uh, New York in 1899, and you know now they have to blend in and and camouflage themselves as humans. So, what do they have to learn, and how are they going to adapt? How are they going to pass basically as human? And so that took a, a lot of time to just sort of figure out detail by detail and, and, and figure out, okay, what can they do? What can't they do? What's going to be the, the stuff that, you know, here you've got Golem, which is, you know, a person made of clay. I, I have it so that she is enough of, you know, she's been built to be someone's wife, so she looks human enough to pass as human. And, but at the same time, like, she doesn't sleep, she doesn't eat, she has immense strength in, but she's in a female body in 1899. And, you know, women were even more constrained in what they were allowed to do back then than they are now. So how, she's going to run up against a lot of, you know, barriers and what is really going to throw her for a loop? Um, is the personality of Hava or Ahmad, you know, similar to you or your, you know, your husband? <laughs> I think I gave her, I think I gave her a lot of my, like, anxiety, some of my insecurity. Um, I don't know. It's sort of funny, especially, you know, over the number of years that I've been working on these books. I, I think we've come closer to each other than I would care to admit. But for my husband, not, he's, he's less Ahmad than I am Hava, I think. He my Kareem is is 
you know, uh, Ahmad is a very free spirit, um, and he has to remember to think about other people and to be responsible and to not just sort of wander off and you know make trouble. And Kareem is can be a very adventurous spirit like that, but he's also one of one of the more responsible people I've ever met. So he there are aspects of that personality perhaps, but it certainly isn't one to one. And how long did it take you to write the whole book? From beginning to end was seven years. Yeah. That was a very long time. And I mean the first two years of grad school and then after that it was uh, we moved out here to California and I spent a lot of time either writing on the sofa or working a very weird series of odd jobs to you know pay the bills but after a number gosh it must have been a number of years I had met and when I was at Columbia I'd met a an agent and you know as, as just you know part of um, life in the program being in New York the professors all you know there's like one night when the professors all have they have bribed their their agents to come and, and meet us and everyone gathers in a big room and it's sort of like a very awkward uh, speed dating sort of a thing where you walk around the room and and pitch your book to agents and collect cards and I managed to uh, meet and, and chat with a man named Sam Stoloff who was intrigued enough by the idea of the book which at that point was roughly 50 pages long and I was just collecting business cards because why the heck not um, but we started corresponding and he would have me send him pages and I you know I'd send them to him and he'd send me comments back and he was very encouraging and then when the book you know this went on for a number of years and then when the book was about half done he said well I think you've got enough that we can sell it now so let's clean it up and you know take it to auction I've got some agent I've got some editors that I can put it in front of if you're willing to sign with me and I was like um heck yes so the book sold to Harper Collins and I had to finish it <laughs> so that was that was that was a bit of crazy year because I also got pregnant a couple months after I sold the book and, and we had been trying for a number of years and and so of course both of these you know very long awaited events happened roughly at the same time and then it was like a race so I finished the, the the baby came first and then I finished the book and I don't remember much about finishing the book but then yeah it was published in 2013. Yeah the thing that struck me was um, I don't want to give the book away but uh, when you talked about Joseph Shaman's past lives, for some mm -hmm. reason, I was like, whoa, that concept <laughs> just blew me away when you described it. Where did that come from? That was really funny. Um, so, and this might be spoiling part of the book, but there, what happened was I, in this roughly, I'd say two or three years into the writing process, I, I didn't know where I was going, really. I sort of, I had these characters and I had, a rudimentary plot and I knew I wanted to explore all of these themes and issues but the actual mechanics of it like I was building as I went and I went down a lot of like dark alleys that I then had to you know backtrack out of but part of this you know there's there's this side plot or sort of running flashback thread that goes through the book that's Ahmad um, in his life in the desert a thousand years ago being this you know a, a very free-spirited genie and they he's he's pursued and captured eventually by a uh, by a wizard a, a you know desert wizard a Bedouin um, is is like the nemesis uh, his nemesis, but he he doesn't have any memory of this in 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 1899. Um, but it's so it's like through the book, it's like we're seeing the things that he's forgotten, and at the same time, you know, I've already written uh, from like the very beginning of the book, Joseph Shulman, who is the creator of of uh, the golem of Chava, who who builds her for this this businessman, this sort of disreputable man who wants to move to America and he wants a wife and no woman will have him so he has a golem built for for him like you do and so i'd written shulman and i'd written this this wizard whose name was ibn malik 
And I, at one point, was just sort of like going over, you know, doing sort of like a, a surface level edit. And I realized that I had described them both using exactly the same physical description. And I was like, well, no, that doesn't, I can't have, you know, they're, they're both very tall and th they're thin and, and, you know, with like this deep voice and, you know, this like sort of skull-like face. They're, you know, very old men. And I was like, well, Helene, you describe them like they're the same guy. And then it was like, it just clicked. They're the same guy. Hmm. And I... I just, I remember I was in my apartment, we were living in Oakland at the time, and it was like, I think I scared the cats, because I started walking around the kitchen table talking to myself, like, oh my god, how am I going to do this? Okay, what if blah, 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 and so it was, um, you know, one of my better idea days, I think, uh, but then I had to figure out, okay, what, what what does that look like from a plot perspective? How do you build that into the book? You know, what every, how many things are going to have to change in order to make this happen, but it felt so right that it was uh, that it just sort of had to be and then I had to you know come up with the idea of okay well why is he constantly being reborn what if it was like this you know this this thing that he had done when he put um, have something to do with the fact that that he'd imprisoned this genie he'd bound himself to this genie and then imprisoned him and then he's in the flask for a thousand years and maybe that means that he can't die and you know so i, I built this whole thing and and then just sort of <laughs> reverse engineered it into the book yeah that's very cool thank you um, it took yeah. a long time <laughs> so you literally kind of discovered it as you're writing the writing yeah to this realization yeah, I don't recommend it as as a writing practice, as as a way to build a very large book with with numerous threads. Writing, you know, figuring it out as you go. I mean, it's sort of crazy making. It's it's like I don't know how no many times is. I wrote that book. <laughs> it, I mean, it worked out really well. And again, the concept was just it was just super interesting. I don't know why it just it just really struck me. That part of the book was like whoa, and that was just a really cool part. It I I've had a number of people tell me that they have missed their subway stops or, you know, bus stop or whatever because they hit that part of it. And as, like, the this whole thing is unfolding with these past lives, like, they they look up and realize that they're, like, three stops later. And yeah. they're like, ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not sorry, but sorry. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, so how long did you take a break before you started on the Hidden Palace and did you not want to do the Hidden Palace, or were you just too exhausted from the first one, or what happened? Well, so I, the second book took just as long to write as the first. That is why it's, why there was seven years between books, was because it just, eight years, I guess, yeah, eight years from publish date to publish date. Um, I started writing it, I, I don't know, immediately, like but within certainly six to nine months of publishing the first one, um, and I... I wanted to write a sequel because I thought that would be easier. Spoiler, it was not. The I had when I started writing the second book, I had a three year old and a one year old or nine months, I guess. And life looked a lot different. And I had to learn how to be a parent and write at the same time which is something that I am still figuring out. It's it's sort of a day by day, you know, when does the writing get done? When does the parenting get done? When does, you know, everything else that goes along with both of those get done? And sort of protecting my career from my family and the other way around. It's all this continual work in progress, um, but I was really bad at it back then. And I kept I kept doing this thing where I would come up with an idea and then immediately jump in without thinking about, again, like down the road, what is this going to look like? And that's fine when you have all day to write, you know, and you can write yourself in and out of any number of, of you know, blind alleys. But it was sort of hellish when it was like I felt like I had to cram every single minute of my non-parenting life with writing, but then I was being so myopic about like, write this particular scene well what does this what is the purpose of the scene what's the scene doing why what's what does it feed into into the overall plot i just wrote and wrote and wrote without a very good direction and i ended up tossing just a ton of stuff 
and eventually what because I okay so I knew that it was going to be a sequel I knew that I wanted Chavan Ahmad to sort of reach the next phase in their relationship at the end of the first book it's a ply that they're going to go on and become more than like the friends slash allies that they have become by the end of the first book they're going to attempt a romantic relationship of some sort whatever that looks like whatever that can possibly look like for them and these are two characters who I built to be pretty much polar opposites in their outlook and in their um, uh, their feelings for humanity and for the idea of like you know existing within a larger community and culture that, that Hava is very you know her nature makes her servant and so she wants to help others and she's very drawn to the people around her even though she has to keep some amount of distance to keep from being discovered Ahmad on the other hand you know is very free spirited and he very he chafes at the idea of community and 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 you know being beholden to others in some way and they just you know they constantly argue about that so part of what I was going to figure out for the second book was okay what what you, you get these two in a room and they start arguing what does a relationship look like when it's these two together if you know the yeah. only thing that's keeping them together is this overarching knowledge that each of them that they are the only ones who know what they're going through that they are hiding together essentially and they are both looking at humanity from a distance and that is the thing that binds them together and is that strong enough to keep them together if you know, or are they just going to hurt each other? Oh, and a question: um, Since your background is is Jewishness and Judaism, um, I don't, have people from your community read the book? The, you know, the original Gollum and the Genie, and were they like, I don't know, did the Gollum idea bother them, or the mysticism bother them? No, you know, not not as far. I mean, okay, I got like one review that basically uh, took me to task for for not being enough of a, of a theologian for them. And I was like, yeah, I'm not a theologian. I'm a fiction writer. <laughs> that is what I do for a living. But I, the book was really, it really connected with a lot of Jewish book groups and a lot of readers who either were into, you know, sort of the, the Jewish historical fiction, but weren't sure about this whole fantasy thing or fantasy readers who weren't sure about this historical fiction thing. So it was a, it's a, it ended up being a crossover book, but in sort of a, you know, there were some hesitant populations that, you know, had to be, you know, I think some of them, it was like, yeah, it's a little too slow and thinky for me. I want more, you know, like fantasy plot and put it down. But a lot of the Jewish readers were sort of coming new to the idea of, you know, rooting for a character who isn't human. I got a number of, you know, I've, you know, over the years I've gotten a number of, you know, I've never read a book like this before. I didn't think I could like a protagonist who wasn't, who who was a monster, basically. And, you know, I felt like, you know, of all the compliments that I get, you know, that's one of my favorites, you know, that I've sort of opened up a world of, of you know, I I, I didn't know that, I could like a book like this. And that's just yeah. cool. That's just like being able to sort of transcend that boundary in that way. I get a lot of people like like you, which is my other favorite compliment, which is I gave this to my kids to read or I gave this to my dad to read or, you know, I, and, and that sort of intergenerational reading because that's how I got into sci-fi and from sci-fi fantasy, but was that my dad was a huge sci-fi fan. And he's the one who got me into, you know, Star Trek and Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. And, you know, and, and that was like the thing that one of the things we talked about together. So knowing that that's something that other families are doing with my book is pretty awesome. Well, but, good. Yeah. But, you, but to you, the, um, okay. well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, oh, no, just answer your original question. Um, I haven't gotten any, like, angry, I haven't gotten any angry emails or anything from people in the Jewish community unless it's something they think I got wrong, like a fact or something. Okay. Um, yeah, so pretty cool. Well, um, I know there is some Jewish mysticism. I don't think it's about making golems, but there's the Kabbalah, you know, the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. um, so have you ever studied that stuff? You're asked about studying what mysticism there is in Judaism? I am curious about it. I haven't really studied it. It's sort of like a surf surface level. Some of it doesn't lend itself to narrative form in the same way that 
I mean, one thing that Christianity has over a lot of religions is there is the story of a guy's life. And that, you know, the life of Jesus is a very good story. Um, and so you can get a lot of good, uh, specifically religious, specifically Christian, you know, fiction that, you know, follows that, you know, Bible stories, they are all, you know, you know, I, I guess I, I shouldn't limit that to, to Jesus, you know, because there's any number of good stories in, in, in the Bible and the Torah and, you know, that, that, you know, many writers have taken and, and transformed into fiction, but they are, are all narrative tales. The, the thing about Kabbalah from, you know, what little I've actually like looked at it and understood is that it is very, very thinky. It is very conceptual. And so it becomes like, okay, but what do you do with that in a book of fiction with a beginning, middle, and end? And it would have to be um, a, a lot deep. I would have to get a lot deeper into it than I, that it would have to be like a huge research sub subject. And so what I did was I kept it more to the surface, like some of it's like folk. I, 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 keep, I keep the magic a little fuzzy. There's mm. a lot of like Jewish folk magic going back, looking at you know some of the the medieval texts that it's it's you know sort of like any religion where they've taken the the what was in it's it's a mishmash of of the the folk legends, religious stories, the you know there's some creature out in the woods. Well, what is it? You know, and that sort of thing where it's about. Well, you take this th things like you you if you want to make a demon disappear, you have to say this name of God, you know. And there's any number of names of God, and it's all that sort of uh, not numerology, but I, I forget what the, the term is for it, where it's letters instead of numbers. You are it's like the seventeen letter name of God. You have to say it, and then you say it again, and you take a letter off, and then you take the next letter off, and then it's like as the name of God dwindles, then the demon will dwindle as well until it disappears. Um, and so I, I use some of the simpler, less heady, mad sort of descriptions of, of that stuff. And I kept the rest of it a bit fuzzy because I just didn't want to go down that road where then I had to, basically, I didn't want to have to get a Jewish studies, you know, PhD in order to write a book of, of fiction. So, I mean, it's like research any, you can, you can just spend the rest of your life doing this stuff. And yeah, I, yeah, I would love to spend the rest of my life researching this stuff. You know, if, if I could make a living just, you know, sitting and reading, I would be, I would love to become, you know, just one of these Renaissance people who know a little bit about everything or a lot about everything, but it's not the best way to write a book. In the okay, end. so, you know, I, I, again, I haven't finished The Hidden Palace, but you know, we will in the next month or two, but what's next for you now in your career? We're getting close to the end of the time here, but yeah, what's next? So what's next is uh, book number three and writing the outline. This this time I am determined that I am going to take a longer time to figure out all the problems ahead of time, which means that I've been working on the outline for a very long time now. But I'm hoping that the process will still be shorter in the um, in the long run if I can, um, you know. And I I say this full well knowing that you know things come up when you're writing the book. And then, you know, for whatever reason, something that, that I, you know, will have planned for years will on the page completely fall apart and I will have to refigure it. But the, I, the hope is, is that if I've, you know, nailed down all the, at least identified all the problems ahead of time, I will be, you know, I'll have a better idea of, of what it is that I'll be changing when I do change something. Um, but when it's, is, uh, when Sony Pictures going to be contacting you to put this into the movies? Wouldn't that be nice? Should it's, it's a great yeah. story. It's been optioned a number of times. Nothing has come oh, of it yet. The, that's the the way this goes. Nine times out of ten is someone buys the rights and then they sit on the shelf for a couple of years till the contract runs out and they say sorry, it wasn't wasn't the right time or whatever. But you know, I'm perfectly happy to take a you know a small check and and have the rights be sold and and just sort of. It, it isn't anything that I'm planning for, but it would be awesome if it did happen. Yeah, would you ever consider uh, making it into, or having someone adapt it into a play that, um, you know, let's say students could put on? Or I think that would be very cool. I think a musical would be awesome. I think there's a number of, of you know, different venues or directions that something like this could go. You know, everyone says to me, so when's the Netflix series? And I'm like... Oh, <laughs> 
maybe not that, but I think a movie would be great for this. But anyway. Yeah. At this point, I'm sort of like, as long as it's done well, I I am willing to to watch anything that is made from this. So, what does your partner Kareem think of all this? Is he like super proud of you, or is he like amazed? What does he think? He's very proud of me, and you know, he's also unfortunately married to a writer, so that you know, it, <laughs> it causes issues sometimes. I work from home, and I don't want to be talked to. And, you know, I have my headphones on and I just sort of glower at people as they try to, you know, start a conversation with me. But, you know, and then he says, you know, so, so how's work going? And I'm, how's the writing? And I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. And he's like, okay. So, you know, that, that part's less than fun, but he's, you know, I think he's very proud of me and I'm very proud of him. He's a, he's a physicist. So um, we've got the art and the sciences represented in the family. Well, very cool. Well, Helene, it was really awesome to talk to you and interview you and you know, get to know you a little bit. And thanks for coming. Um, so, I mean, the books are available everywhere. People can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or they can get the audio versions, as I understand. Like, yes. Where are they available? They are available anywhere books are sold, whether that's online or my favorite, which is independent bookstores. You can get the audio pretty much anywhere, too, I think, whether that's, you know, can Audible or Libro FM, your local library. Yeah, they are out and available. And you can reach me online at HelenWecker.com. Very good. Helene, again, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a great call. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was, this was a lot of fun. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.